who is, in your estimation, the most formidable opponent that you have faced off on stage? I want to go into a debate, and if the other guy doesn't show up, I can give his presentation as well as he could have given it anyway. If you could go back and talk to this young man, what would you say to him? If I were to want to win debates today, mm -hmm. I wouldn't debate the way I debate. I would go for the emotions. This is an art. It's not science. Like, to be able to figure out what to say and what not to say, what to pull out in terms of a brief, it's like rock and roll. For me, cross-examination is where the debate takes place. Let's talk about your debate with Trent Horn. And on Thursday in March, I debate Leighton Flowers. Oh my god! I'm going to debate on John 6. What he's going to be debating about <laughs> is yet to determine. Dr. James White, thank you so much for joining me today. Me? So, just just James, we don't need the long all the long title stuff. Well, I'm trying to do the uh, Joe Ventilacion, you know, uh, <laughs> Dr. White. Uh, let me ask you a question, Dr. White. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation like that? I mean, I, you couldn't see what I could see. I mean, there's five guys. They've got three rows of books. And evidently in the Philippines, that's, that means you're right. You know, and they keep looking over at me and I'm sitting here all alone with a notepad and a, and a Bible. And um, wow, that was, I've done 182 moderated public debates and that was definitely one of them. That was definitely one <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely one of them, yeah. No, uh, I, I'm sure we're going to actually circle back around and talk about that. So I, yeah, yeah. anyway, uh, I've been reviewing debates for the last couple of years on this uh, YouTube channel called Wise Disciple, and you are by far one of the best debaters, if not the best that I've ever seen. And it's not just me saying it. My, my viewers are very much in agreement on this. Even some of our Catholic viewers, folks who are not Reformed, you know, they agree as well. So I'm very excited to get into the issue of debate with you. So maybe we can start here. You can just tell us about how you got started in debate. Did, did you do any debating in school or did that come like later on? The funny thing is uh, I went to a brand new high school. I was the first four-year graduating class uh, of that high school. So it was very small and we had nothing. Um, there was an honors class that I was a part of at one point, but uh, there was no debate team. There was no debate class. Um, I went to Grand Canyon College when it was still much, much smaller. Now it's Grand Canyon University. It's huge. But back then it was about the same size as my high school. And uh, uh, there really wasn't anything there. Honestly, the, the first indication that that might be something that I would be have any uh, facility at all uh, came in my senior year. Um, I was class valedictorian. Um, I got a full ride scholarship to Grand Canyon. I never got a B, blah, blah, blah. I was that guy, never got a demerit, never late to class, any of that stuff. I'm that, I'm that man. Mm. And senior year, I'm bored. Remember being a senior and uh, you just, you're tired <laughs> of this, you're ready to move on. Yeah. And um, yeah. in the government class, which I had to take, um, they offered an extra credit thing, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, as you know, um, attorneys, uh, law, there's a lot of parallels uh, to, mm -hmm. to debate. And so I wasn't interested. I didn't need extra credit. I already had like 112% of the points, so I didn't need any of that. But I'm sitting there looking, and I look at the defense. The next nine people on the honor roll are all on the defense. And the prosecution is nobody. <laughs> and so I'm bored, and I'm like you know, this could be fun. And so I signed up for the prosecution and mm. I lived that subject for a couple of months. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and jump out of bed and make a note. I went out to ASU. I got the Warren Commission report. I mean, I lived it. And wow. I, got, I got 11 to one for conviction. And the one holdout was a girlfriend of somebody on the defense team. Uh, we didn't get to really choose the, the jury very well, if you know what I mean. But yeah. afterwards, I had stoners. You've got to picture this. I had potheads coming up to me at school after, because they had attended it to get extra points. After that trial going, hey, dude, man, I got busted over the weekend. Could you, like, you know, help me out? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was sort of an indication uh, of, of, of what was to come. But no. Honestly, um, the debates, 
I suppose, you know, when you go out to the Easter pageant of the LDS church and you're surrounded by uh, 12 more missionaries and you're answering each one of their questions and you're, you're trying to stay focused on getting a certain message out and stuff like that, I suppose that has some parallels. But honestly, my introduction to debate outside of uh, the Bonson-Stein debate or something like that um, was listening to Jerry Matitix, who was John Gerstner's favorite student, who was the first ordained PCA minister to convert to Roman Catholicism. Wow. And someone started sending me tapes. These are called cassette tapes. They're now in museums, but cassette <laughs> tapes of uh, Jerry Matitix and a guy named Scott Hahn, Dr. Scott Hahn today, um, debating evangelical pastors, mainly Calvary Chapel guys. Yeah. And uh, this was when I was writing my first couple of books, which everybody expected to be on, on Mormonism. That was my third book. But my first two were actually The Fatal Flaw and Answers to Catholic Claims. And we sent those to Catholic Answers. Jerry Matitix worked for Catholic Answers at the time. And within a week, uh, Jerry was on the phone uh, challenging us to debate, which took place, I believe it was August 16th, 1990, in uh, Long Beach, California. And oh, wow. uh, it was at a large Roman Catholic church. Um, I, like I said, had no, no training, but I had been listening. I knew what to expect from Jerry. Mm -hmm. And um, it, that's, it started from there. I mean, uh, he and I then did some debates uh, just a few months later in, in Arizona. Uh, that led to debates with Mitch Pacwa in San Diego. And it just started snowballing from there. And uh, so, no, I did not have... Uh, you know what, honestly, was what was the best training I had at that point yeah. in my life was starting my sophomore year. I had a job. I was a radio announcer. And so, I mean, we're talking turntables, 33 uh, RPM <laughs> records, um, you know, yeah. uh, UPI News, yeah. at the top of the hour. And I've told people many times that has been one of the greatest advantages I have had in debate is that I know how to use a clock. And so uh, if you, you've listened to a lot of my debates, you know, I'm, I finish my statement in my allotted time and can make my point to the audience. And I don't look like I'm rushed and I'm having to, well, I'll get to the, that later on, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what it is about everybody else, but they don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I was a radio yeah. announcer, I had to back time records. So they're finishing right as I'm giving the, this is KWAO FM 106.3, home of the great entertainers. The time to tone, 7 p.m. Here's UPI World News. And bing, there's the tone, and, and you're done. So you have to, I have to do that. And mm -hmm. that has been, clock control has been really, really helpful. Uh, it honestly has been. So there was sort of that. And no fear of microphones. You know, yeah. when, you, when you sit in front of a microphone for 36 hours a week, you, you, you can't be nervous about it and what you're saying and what people are going to hear you saying, stuff like that. So that was part of it, too. Yeah, that's amazing that you had no formal training uh, in school or anything like that. And it's, it's, it almost sounds like trial by fire. Uh, just jump right in. It, it, it was, except for one thing. Um, in uh, about three years in, uh, and this was a God thing, big time. Um, I did two debates, two nights in a row, when the Pope visited Denver in 1993 for World Youth Day. Mm. I debated Jerry again. I debated Jerry 13 times now. Um, we had tried to get Carl Keating and Patrick Madrid of Catholic Answers to debate. Um, they told us they weren't going to do a debate. And then once I scheduled with Jerry, they scheduled a debate. And I don't know if you've ever heard it. If you want torture... If you if you want to beat your head against the wall, I can I can send you the tape of the debate they did because it was it was bad. But I debated Jerry for seven and a half hours over two nights on the papacy. The first mm. night was at Denver Seminary, and that was on the New Testament evidence. After the debate, a man came up to me, and you know what? I'll never meet him until heaven, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but a man came up to me, and. You know, he didn't condescendingly speak to me. He didn't put his arm around me, do this type of thing. He just basically said, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing. You're doing a good job. But let me make a suggestion. You've mm. got to bring your audience along with you. 
It doesn't matter how much good information you get out if you're not bringing them along with you. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure you're communicating to them. Don't go so fast that you lose them and they're, they're not following what you're saying. And I could have responded to that negatively. I could have been, you know, my ego or something like that. I mm -hmm. listened to them and I immediately made changes in how I was doing things. And I'm like, you know what? I do need to do that. And right around the same time, I learned the value of cross-examination. Uh -huh. It's not like somebody walked up and said, this is the value of cross-examination. But I, I started to realize that those questions that we were allowed to ask is really where the debate takes place. That's mm. where it happens. That's mm -hmm. where the two sides are brought together and you can test the other side for consistency. Yeah. And other, th other than two attorneys that I've, I've debated, every other attorney I've ever debated stunk at cross-examination. I mean, like they had never even heard of it before. Yeah. Um, and, and so for me, uh, cross-examination is where the debate takes place because you can, you can go watch some other guy's presentations on his website, listen to my presentations on my website. You don't need mm -hmm. to have a debate. What's the value of the debate? The debate is when the two sides have to interact with one another in a meaningful fashion. Yeah. And that's the best yeah. way in the world to demonstrate inconsistencies of position. I'm so glad to hear you say that because I've been saying that for uh, years now that cross examination is where the magic happens. You know, you, you, you and you find out really quickly whether you can shine or whether you're going to suck very badly <laughs> in cross exam, you know, because uh, that's where you draw a true clash. And um, I, I completely agree. Can I? So I want to. I want to stay here, but then I also want to circle back around really quickly. You shared a photo with me. Just take a look at. <laughs> maybe you can tell us who this is. <laughs> <laughs> who is this well, young okay, man? Oh uh, well, look at the hair for everybody's hair. I mean, is this not 1981? Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> and and look at look at look at what's on the on the table. That is. A beautiful 30 out six I bought from my dad actually for Father's Day back in those days. And wow. nobody said a word about my walking into that school with a fully functional 30 out six in, in my hand. That was 1981. That gives you an idea. Um, yeah. But yes, that's me. And uh, Debbie Tupper's looking up at me over there. I remember some of these folks, anyways. Yeah. And now the funny thing was, I had my witnesses prepared. I, I ran their Warren Commission report testimonies. I had a bound copy for them, a bound copy for me. Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean when I say I got into it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's me yeah. in, a, in a really nice brown corduroy suit. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is you know, uh, at 100 and, 142 pounds, baby. <laughs> Wow. That, <laughs> oh, I, look at I, that. Man, I'll tell you. Oh, isn't that great? Isn't what, that great, what, man? What, what is going on in your mind at this moment? Young James White, what's going on? Um, I'm hoping that all my witnesses will remember their testimony, basically. <laughs> um, I, I can't be worried about the fact that the people on the jury... Uh, okay, one of those guys, the second guy from the left in the second row was yeah. one of the first people I even got to know when I moved to Arizona. So maybe that was an unfair part on my side. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm thinking, will Mike Nixon remember what he's supposed to remember as I'm <laughs> get And that was the, the teacher sitting there who's the, who's the judge. He was the head of the honors thing. And so that's, that's how all that got, got put together. But different world yeah. back then, man. I can tell you. Different uh, world. It, it really, really was. Uh, at, yeah, at, yeah. At, we, at even, that point, we even had the Zapruder film. We had the Zapruder film in slow motion on a TV for that for that um, uh, wow. that trial. I mean, that, that, that's not that's not too bad. That's not too bad. No, that's excellent. I I feel an affinity for your teacher. I so I taught debate uh, at a school in Vegas for a number of years, and at at the culmination of the year, I would do a mock murder trial. And so we would do something extremely similar, uh, and all the students would get involved. So I, I, I think your teacher's onto something there. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. At this point, though, does young James White have an inkling of what God is going to do, like through you in your life? 
Um, by that, that was senior year. Um, up to that point, up, up until between my sophomore and junior year in high school, I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. Um, uh -huh. That's why I had all straight A's because my eyes weren't good. So I, I would need to have the best grades possible and stuff like that. And then between my sophomore and junior year, the Lord really got a uh, hold of me. And I, at that point in time, I wasn't sure what kind of ministry it was going to be. Uh, when I actually went to Grand Canyon, I was thinking about medical missionary work or something like that because I was a double major Bible and biology. Mm. Um, and then I got married between my freshman and sophomore years uh, in high school. Um, oh. I, I was actually already dating my future wife when that picture was taken, I think. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, two more missionaries uh, showed up at my sister-in-law's uh, door about six weeks after Kelly and I got married. Now, my wife's an identical twin, so they're talking to her identical twin, Shelly. Mm -hmm. And Shelly mm -hmm. asks me to come over to talk to these two more missionaries, Elders Reed and Reese. And we met for about three hours on a Monday and three hours on the fol following Thursday. Mm -hmm. I read two or three books on Mormonism in between. And I was deeply convicted, even though I was a preacher's kid, um, that I did not know enough about my faith to make it clear to them. And I certainly did not know enough about their faith to overcome the obvious language barrier that existed between us. Yeah. And that's what started what became Alpha and Omega Ministries was that study that I began at that point in time. You, you we're talking about how it, everything got started for you, you know, and and I'm sure there was an element of this where you, you couldn't have had any idea, like wh you where you would be right now uh, in terms of ministry, in terms of experience and success. But you know, like if you could go back and talk to this young man, what what would you say to him? Well, you know. Uh, I think it's wise that, um, actually, now that I look at the date, Kelly and I started uh, dating about two months after that. So I, I want to be very accurate in my term, terminology here. Um, I, I, I've said many times, I'm glad God doesn't let us know uh, what's coming because yeah. I think yeah. it would have been a real distraction in Bible college or seminary to know that in a number of decades, I'd be standing in front of the Qibla in the Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in Erasmia, South Africa, with Muslims sitting on the floor five feet in front of me, all through this building, uh, presenting the gospel and, and my unworthiness of the righteousness of Christ and, and telling them things they've never heard in their lives. Mm. Uh, as I stand where the Imam had led the prayers only a half hour earlier. Wow. And uh, you, you just don't forget, you don't forget things like that. Um, and I think it would have been a distraction. I think it would have been, you know, uh, you have to take things slowly. You have to do things step by step. Mm -hmm. And one of the things mm -hmm. I was really thankful for through my ministry is I've never tried to be the Bible answer man. I've been on the Bible answer man a lot of times back in the olden days, but yeah. I never, I never yeah. felt that that was really wise. No one has the breadth of knowledge to be able to do all of that kind of stuff. And so we we refuse to go into certain areas of research and ministry simply because I can't do all of that. I, I want to do what I do well mm -hmm. um, and then let the Lord expand that out over time. So we started with Mormonism and then people started coming to a class and they start asking questions about Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I start getting Jehovah's Witness material. And by the way, no one ever told me no one ever told me, get the original sources, get mm. their books, understand how they think, understand how they would express their own positions. I had no one to tell me that. Yeah. But once I read pretty much every book at the Christian bookstore on Mormonism, I'm like, you know, there are these books I keep seeing referenced over and over again, like called the Journal of Discourses, 26 volumes, of the early sermons of, of the church. Um, Mormon doctrine, Bruce R. McConkie, uh, the yeah. Teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith by Joseph Feeling Smith, Articles of Faith by James Talmadge. And so I start becoming a regular at the LDS bookstore. And being a radio announcer, especially while the California Angels were playing, which we carried from 7-10 till the end of the baseball game, yeah. once every half hour, I had to go click. 
<laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of time to be doing your schoolwork, and then for me, studying Mormonism from the original sources. And one of the greatest advantages I've had in debates is I I I want to go into a debate, and if the other guy doesn't show up, I can give his presentation as well as he could have given it anyways. Right. That's what I want. I can't yeah. always do that. But it's a yeah. huge advantage. If you want to see if you want to see this played out big time, 2001 debate, Long Island with Dr. Peter Stravinskis. This guy is a double PhD from Ivy League schools, editor mm -hmm. of the Catholic Answer. And he starts off a presentation debating a reformed person like me, talking about his conversations with Jimmy Swaggart. Okay, that's not okay. exactly where I'm coming from. You know what I mean? He has <laughs> yeah. no idea, no idea whatsoever what I actually believe. Yeah. And so halfway through, he's pulling on his collar. He wants out of there so bad. It's a, a clear indication of what happens when one person comes in and doesn't care a whit what the other person believes, fit, think that they have it all figured out. I had read everything he had ever written on the subject of purgatory going into that debate. That's wow. what you want to be able to do. If you have the right. time to do it, obviously. Uh, but yeah. It's just, again, I'll, I'll say this another, like one more time. It's just amazing that without a mentor, without, you know, somebody, some kind or, or formal training at all, that you have been able to become so accomplished. And, um, and I guess maybe we should stay on this, uh, this question of process because I'm curious. And I know a lot of the viewers are curious about this. Like, what does your, debate prep look like? So, so from the moment that you agree to a debate, what does that look like for you? How long do you give yourself for prep and, and what do you do for prep? Well, obviously that's going to depend on uh, lots of different situations. I, when I debated people like Bart Ehrman, uh, John Dominic Crossan, I mean, Crossan has an IQ so high up there, it's, it's unbelievable. Or mm. someone who has a really unique view, view like James Price. I spent months I read everything that Bart Ehrman wrote. I listened to all of his classes. I read his doctoral dissertation, which was on the rise of the proto-evangelical uh, Eva Alexandrian text type, sorry, in the early, early church. Um, I, I immersed myself in where these people are coming from because I take it very, very serious. I'm trying to, trying to create a body of work that's gonna be useful after I'm moldering in the grave. And the only way to do that is not do what we're, COVID created a cottage industry debating, but people sitting in their, in their t-shirts in the, in the basement with a fan going on the, on the ceiling, and they took this debate two days ago is not what I'm talking about when I talk about serious <laughs> debate that's gonna have long-term use. Right. And so for guys like that, for those, those big type of debates with, with leading scholars, um, you know, three, six months of, of intense work is what I would do. Now, I'll be honest with your audience right now. I'm not sure what I've done in, a, in scheduling what I have coming up in February and March. I'm Ooh. going on a road trip. Ooh. Of course, I go in this unit. Um, I'm going to Dallas to be on um, Ali Beth Stuckey's program talking to a Catholic apologist. Don't know who yet. Mm. I drive from Dallas mm. to Houston. In Houston, I will be debating Trent Horn two nights in a row, one on Sola Scriptura, one on Purgatory. Now, Trent Horn's the best the Catholic Answers has. We've yeah. debated twice yeah. in the past. He's very, very good. Um, then I go to Tullahoma, Tennessee. I debate a fellow on particular redemption as a part of a Calvinism conference, what, mm. which I'm also speaking mm. at and preaching at. Then I go from there to Grace Bible Theology. Uh, uh, yeah, Grace Bible Theological Seminary, where I'm professor of church history and apologetics. I teach a class on Baptist history, which I'm not prepared for yet. Then I go from there back to Houston. Yeah. And on Thursday in March, I debate Leighton Flowers. Oh, my God. On John, on John 6. Well, I'm going to debate on John 6. What he's going to be debating <laughs> about is yet to German. But, uh, and he's gotten so much flack about that, that I'm hoping it'll actually be on John chapter six. And then I've got one night off and then I debate Dale Tuggy, Dr. Dale Tuggy, the leading Unitarian in the United States right now on wow. is Jesus Yahweh. 
five major debates, one road trip, not including the Ali Best Stucky show. Right. Um, I'm really questioning my wisdom um, <laughs> right now because just the, the the amount of preparation you know i'm i'm one of four pastors of a rapidly growing church I've, i mm. do the dividing line regularly just tried to do i did one show today but we had to record it um i'll be honest um uh, i'm not sure that i will be as prepared as i would like to be. now i have asked for the first time I, I don't normally ask for people to help me prepare for a debate because I figure if I'm sitting in the debate, I've got to know this material. It can't be something that somebody gave me uh, a, a cheat sheet on. Okay. Yeah. I, I need to have gotten this information myself. Mm -hmm. This time I've actually asked for a bunch of other people. Um, please help me uh, because I just have so much uh, to try to prepare for in this one trip. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, what if I get sick? <laughs> you know, I mean, um i don't know wow. but that, that's what's coming up and i i hope it goes well uh i'm certainly praying to, toward that end but yeah. um it's gonna be it's gonna be i even said on the dividing line yesterday i need to start focusing what i'm talking about on the dividing line onto those particular subjects instead of you know all the stuff that's out there that that is very very distracting right. um because i want to really be be focused but those subjects are so far apart from one another mm. um, that that it's going to be super super challenging. If it, if they are all you know related subjects, okay, fine. But purgatory, John six, Unitarianism, um, how do you how do you even you know, tie those types of things together? You're not going to be able to. So, right? Yeah, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. Well, we're uh, we're rooting for you. That's that's quite a heavy lift. <laughs> So, I mean, I think we're connect connecting to the next question that I had for you. So let me just go ahead and ask it. You know, our country was formed through rigorous debate. Um, many of our founding fathers were excellent debaters. Uh, I would say it's through good debate that we wrestle with ideas and draw good conclusions as individuals and a society overall. And then, of course, in terms of theology and apologetics, debate is extremely beneficial. But as each year goes by, it seems like we're moving further and further away from the principles of good communication. Uh, actually, it seems like we're devolving. Well, good so. thought. <laughs> good thought. Just good thinking. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, let's be honest. Um, if I were to want to win debates today in an, unpro in an improper way, mm -hmm. I wouldn't debate the way I debate. I would go for the emotions. Yeah, and that because that's how you win debates today. Uh, but I can't do that. I I, I have a higher standard. So um, it's it's we live. You're you're about to say what I am dealing with all the time, and that is the fact that we live in a society where we have now confused thought with feeling and equated right. the two. And that's you have to say hard things in a debate. You have to say the other side's wrong. And when you live in a yeah. society where you're not allowed to say anybody's wrong about anything without offending someone, um, yeah, um, I'm glad. Let's put it this way. I'm glad I'm a Christian debater because then I can trust that the Spirit of God will use his truth uh, in the hearts and lives of the people he wants to use it that way. Because if I didn't have that, I don't know that I would have any commitment whatsoever to consistency, truthfulness, stuff like that. Uh, right. because I just be, I just be doing what advertisers do play to the emotions. Don't worry about the facts. Mm. Well, maybe we're already starting to answer this a little bit, but you know, what to you, what is the value of debate? Uh, why do you continue to participate in these debates? Well, you know, when it, it's similar to writing books, I've, I've written more than 20 books and whenever anybody starts writing a book, like when John Cooper, he's just put a new book out, uh, front man for skillet. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've helped him, uh, you know, focus his thinking and stuff on both of the books that he's written now. And I've, I've told John, I said, you've, you've got to decide who is my audience, who am I trying to communicate to? And when I'm in a debate, I realize that you have, you have of the whole spectrum, uh, you have a whole bunch of people on their side that are, they're not gonna hear a word you have to say. You mm -hmm. could be sw speaking Swahili, it won't make any difference to them. They're not gonna listen to you. Their right. side has already won in their mind. And I've got a whole group of people like that on my side too. Okay, so I, 
there's nothing I can do about that. And then the third in the middle, you've got the people on their side that are are willing to listen somewhat, and you might get them on a journey. And there's people on my side that are maybe confused about some things. They need to be firmed up in their faith. And then you got the people that swath right in the middle that mm. really want to know what in the world the truth about this particular issue is. And so you have to make a decision where you're going to focus. Um, this especially becomes the case because, as you know, you can pretty much plan out the beginning of the debate. If you know the other side's position, you can pretty much know what you're going to need to be rebutting. But once you get into the cross-ex and then the final portions of the statements, you have to be ready to, to go with what has happened in the debate itself. That's and right. that includes not only reading your opponent, but that also includes reading the audience. And yeah. so you yeah. have to be making decisions. What do I need to emphasize? What's most important here? Every debater, and this is, this is where a lot of scholars, this is why a lot of scholars should never debate. Mm. You, I, I met with a, an Erasmus scholar in Berlin once for dinner, and he was just an, an, a walking encyclopedia. Yeah. But every yeah. time you asked him a question, he literally sat there for about 30 seconds, literally 30 seconds. People don't realize how long 30 seconds is. Yep. Literally yeah. would stare at you for 30 seconds before he would then give you a publishable answer, you know, that was that that's like from one of these AI bots, but is actually real. <laughs> um, but you don't have 30 seconds in a debate that's right. to be formulating that's right. the perfect answer. Mm -hmm. If there's almost any delay at all, people are figuring, oh, got you on that one. And so the the mental process of listening to the other side, taking accurate notes. And then as you're taking accurate notes and to answer the inevitable question, yes, I'm using a remarkable tablet these days. Um, well, as you're taking those notes, you have these bullet points. And one of the things you've got to do while still listening is prioritize those points. And you're not going to get to all of them because, you know, I suppose if debates were really the way they used to be, you know how long the debate was in Leipzig when, uh, when Luther took on Eck. Uh, that was that was all morning. Take a break for lunch all afternoon. Uh, go out and drink too much German beer in the evening. And so, you know, that was that was a football trip uh, for the university students back then. But it was hours long, and 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 Luther even had time to go to the library to look stuff up during lunch hour. That's not how we do debates anymore. And right. so since each time frame gets shorter and shorter, you have to be going in light of my goals. How am I going to prioritize these points that I've heard him make and that I need to respond to? And the fact is, there's some points you are not going to be able to respond to. That that's just the the nature of the beast. Yeah. And doing that on the fly, I think, is one of the hardest things for for people to do when they get into debate. That that's something I can tell people they need to do it, but it's not really something that everyone is. Um, conditioned to be able to do both here right prioritize all at the same time yeah for a lot of folks that's yeah. like yeah no, I'm, I'm i can't i can't go there hey real quick i'm so glad that you're watching but did you know that 68 percent of you that watch are not subscribed to the channel can you believe that that blew my mind when i saw that that's amazing would you please help me get this video out to more people by liking and subscribing to the channel i really do appreciate it I'm so grateful that you bring this up and, and you're, so, I mean, I've, I've interviewed other debaters in the past, but you're the only one that's brought this up. And I, and I'm really grateful because I, I think it should, there should be a spotlight on this. It, it's almost like, and I don't even know how to categorize it, but like the economics of language in debate is, is key. It, and, and I've tried to, when I would try to teach my students, it was almost like, it, this is an art. It, you, it's not science. Like to be able to figure out what to say and what not to say. You know what to what to pull out in terms of a brief and and what not to, um, what to cut. You know, it's it's really. Um, I don't know. It's like music. It's like rock and roll. It is. It is. And I and I and and I don't think anyone should ever feel bad if they are are not skilled in that particular 
uh, capacity of that particular area. Like I said, there are scholars so much, so far beyond me in intellect and knowledge and everything else, but they should never debate because yeah. they'll look silly when they're doing it because they just, they can't think along those lines and, and be able to rapidly put information into a usable, into a usable form. But that is the key to being a successful debater. And when I may mean successful, I mean communicating both to your side so your side feels like they have been adequately represented. They're like, yeah, boy, I'm, I couldn't have put it that way. That's good. And then the other side has to go, well, he didn't misrepresent us anyways, and I'm not really sure what to do with what he said about what we believe, but, but I, I've, you've, you've communicated. That's, that's success, success for me. Yeah. And not everyone I debate allows for that success to happen. It takes, it takes two people to make a good debate. And I can name mm -hmm. names of people who are very good at making the debate pretty much a waste of time for everybody. There's certain ways you can do that. And um, then there are other people that have good integrity and it makes for great debates um, because they stay focused. Every debate I did with Mitch Pack, with Father Mitchell Pack, with Dr. Mitchell Pack, with speaks 12 languages for crying out loud. Um, we did five debates and I say to everybody on Roman Catholicism, those are the best, best debates to listen to, not because they're the most exciting. There's some, there's some nice humor in it. You can tell we like each other. That helps. Um, but because he doesn't play games and he doesn't pull punches and he gives honest answers and therefore you really get to the heart of the issue. Mm -hmm. But I can name all sorts of other debaters. Their ability is to obfuscate not to clarify. Mm -hmm. And that's true in all of the areas. So uh, my debate with Abdullah Kunda at University of New South Wales in 2011 in Australia on uh, can God become man is still my favorite Muslim debate because Abdullah, unlike almost all the rest of my Muslim opponents, Abdullah read my book on the Trinity and therefore tried to create an argument from the Muslim side that would be understandable to Christians. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you just don't understand how unusual that is. And it made for, I thought, just, just the best um, discussion on that subject that, that I've had. And that was 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of it does depend on the other person. And if someone wants to sink a debate, you know, they can, they can do it. Um, but I, I, there's only so much you can do from your side. Uh, to make right. the debate work. Let's talk about your debate with Trent Horn. Uh, and it, it it was over whether a Christian can lose their salvation. I actually spoke with Horn about that debate. And if I remember this right, he likened it to Rocky fighting Apollo Creed. So... <laughs> um, Which one was he? I think you were Apollo Creed. Oh, like this okay. Was, this was Rocky one. Uh, so, so what, you know, what's your take on that debate and on Horn as a debater? Uh, well, th th that's two different issues. The, the topic is not one that I like to debate because the reality is that particular topic is based on the only way to get to, from the reform perspective, to get to that conclusion is four or five things that come before it, which he and I wouldn't agree on, but which weren't a part of the debate. And when you only have 20 minutes, um, so it, it's not one of my favorite topics to do, uh, first of all. Uh, Trent is really sharp, but I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what's been happening recently, because like I said, I'm, I'm debating him on Sola Scriptura yeah. in, um, in February. And he's done some debates uh, with Gavin Ortland on this subject. And what I'm finding fascinating, I've, I've been... Okay, my first debate with Roman Catholic was 1990. Okay, uh, that was yeah. that was 33 years ago. That was under John Paul II, not Francis. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of evolution and a lot of change, and Francis is changing everything. And so things are different now. And I'm really surprised because uh, Trent is making arguments regarding the nature of Scripture the Catholic answers would not have touched 20 years ago. Would not have, mm. not have come near it 20 years ago, really denying mm. that scripture is ontologically unique over against tradition. They've always subsumed scripture to tradition, but 
up until recently, up until the past couple of years, every Roman Catholic apologist I've debated, Mitch Pacwa, all of them, would have admitted scripture is ontologically unique. It is the only thing that is theonustos, only thing that is God breathed. Trent is sort of going the progressive route uh, on this. And I'll be honest with you, um, you may have noticed liberals don't do debates because they have nothing to debate. They don't, mm -hmm. there, there's, no obje there's no objective truth to be worried about. And so to start borrowing from that realm, um, I think in the long run is going to be extremely damaging to, to him and to Catholic apologetics if they, if they go that direction. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be interested to see where that goes because uh, he's been citing a study from a guy who says Theonostos does not mean God breathed. It means giving life. And uh, if that comes up in our debate, um, there's, there's a lot of background material there that Trent, I do not believe, has the training to be able to deal with, but I do. I've taught Greek. I've taught Greek exegesis. Uh, mm -hmm. I've used the TLG CD-ROM in my research for, for doctoral work, and he has not. And so if, if, if that's where it goes, it's going to have to go there. Um, so I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. It'll be, it'll be unique anyways. It'll be different because here's a guy. Um, now, I'm defending Sola Scriptura, but he's a Roman Catholic. He has to deal with the fact that his pope... Um, has changed the Roman Catholic Church's teaching on capital punishment and is in the process of setting the mechanisms in motion to make major moral and ethical changes in the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. He's got to deal with that. And I'm, I'm not the one saying that. Roman Catholics are the ones saying that. Bishops, archbishops are the ones saying that. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a tough time to be in his shoes. And he can't duck that. He can't say, oh, uh, we, don't, we can't worry about that. No, you're presenting your own side. You're presenting a position here too. And I can use that as an illustration of what happens when you deny Sola Scriptura is you end up in the, in the spot that you're in right now. So it'll be an interesting evening. Uh, it'll be an interesting evening. Uh, the next night's purgatory. And that mm -hmm. might end up proving to be a more interesting evening because when I debated Jerry Mattix at Boston College in 93, Three, we did the Apocrypha and Justification by Faith. And both Jerry and I sort of agreed. Yeah. We, we hoped we'd be yeah. heard over the snoring uh, in the <laughs> Apocrypha. Um, it ended up being far more uh, interesting than the Justification debate because what it ended up boiling down to was issues of authority. And I'm, I'm wondering if that mm. the Purgatory debate may not surprise us as well. Yeah. Who is probably, in your estimation, the most formidable opponent that you have faced off on stage? Well, you see, how do you, how do you define formidable? Um, you can define formidable in the sense of ability to make the debate hard and uh, make it hard for you to really make your points. You can mm -hmm. make it as far as their intellectual capacity and the breadth of their knowledge. And then it's going to be what, what Muslim debater uh, what Catholic debater, what Mormon debater, what atheist debater, because it's all in different, it's all in different areas. So uh, John Dominic Crossan is undoubtedly uh, probably, he, he's, the, he's the most intelligent man. I, I'd say he has the, the highest IQ of anyone that I have uh, taken on. Now, my advantage in debating Dom um, and I, by the way, I, we, we took him on a cruise afterwards. We had a debate on the boat on resurrection. Mm. And uh, I told him, you know, you are my favorite heretic. And so he just sort of adopted that and went, okay, that's cool. You know, uh, he's a really, he's a wonderfully nice little Irishman. Uh, he really, really is. Um, but he, it's, it's like he had never met someone like me. It's like I, meeting me was like meeting someone from another planet. Because he had spent the entire decade of the 60s studying the Gospels in a cell in a monastery. So he had never had any interaction with someone like myself. And the first time we met, he started telling me a story. I finished his story because I read his autobiography. And he's, he just can't believe that someone who has my beliefs would take the time to know his story, to have read his own autobiography and to know his position so well that he was just blown away by that. And it made for a great debate as a result. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, and this is a really interesting story. I, I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time here, but, and I'm not in a hurry. So you, you oh, okay. uh, don't, don't worry about cutting off right at the top of the hour. Um, 
I learned something, and I'm not cons- I'm not always completely consistent in applying this, but especially with my Muslim debates, because I've now done more Muslim debates than any other group, just barely more than Roman Catholicism. Um, I debated Adnan Rashid. I don't know if you've seen any of my debates with Adnan. Um, but Adnan Rashid is a big, tall Pakistani guy. Mm-hmm. And the first time he and I debated in London, it was it was a it was a street brawl. Um, he is a well known veteran at Speaker's Corner in London. Now, I know you know Speaker's Corner, mm-hmm. and they at Speaker's Corner, people just basically learn to yell and scream at each other. You, it's a good place to learn how to continue a thought with people with multiple people screaming at you at the same time. Is basically what Speaker's Corner is about. And that's all Adnan knew. And that's all Adnan knew about Christians was that they would yell and scream back. And so the first couple of debates he and I had, there's one of them where we're, we did sort of two debates in one night, one on the transmission of the text of the New Testament, and then the second one, the transmission of the text of the Quran to compare the two. And he had a bunch of these young guys right down in the front row. It was at a Christian church. And they're he they're doing takbir Allahu Akbar on all sorts of stuff like this, mm-hmm. and then I made a really strong point, and they're quiet. And I just look at them and go, "What? I don't get an I don't get a takbir," and they did not know what to do with this Christian. It's looking at them going, "Come on, guys, let's be consistent." You know, they just did not even know what to do. So so Adnan and I were doing two debates at Trinity in Dublin. Have you ever been to Trinity in Dublin? No. Okay, so you've been to the reading room. Oh, you haven't? Oh, okay. I uh, know. The reading room at Trinity in Dublin is one of the seven most amazing things mankind has ever made. I mean it. Look it up on Google. Look at look at the 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 books to the ceiling and the smell. Oh my goodness, it is amazing. And so just to get to the debate at Trinity College in Dublin is pretty amazing. Mm. We debated one night actually at, um, at another place. And then the next night it was going to be at Trinity. I asked Adnan to meet me for lunch. Finding a place to eat with a Muslim is not always easy. <laughs> You're looking mm. for halal food and stuff like that, <laughs> right. you know? And so we meet at this like Panera bread stuff, something like that. And <sighs> Nate, what I did is I just looked this man in the eye and I said, this is why I debate. Um, This is why I care about you. This is why I care about the Muslim people. Mm -hmm. That had never happened with him before. And he realized that I do what I do because I really believe it and I actually care about him. And what the Muslims can't understand about me and the reason they don't know what to do with me is I, I accurately represent their position I will not compromise on mine and I care about them and they don't know what to do in that situation. Mm. The debate that night at Trinity college completely different than the night before. And if you look at any of the debates that Adnan and I have done since then, they're completely different than the ones we did. We, I think we did three before. I think we've done three since then you could, it, it just comparing them would be an interesting study. Because all of a sudden, now you have a relationship. And so, like, he and I debated at an evangelical church in London a number of years ago. And I could, he would, he would start sort of getting a little Adnan-ish, which means getting a little, you know. And yeah. I just sort of look over at him and I go, Adnan. And he'd, he'd get this smile on his face and he'd sort of look to, I know. It changed everything. Wow. We met for lunch. In London, I actually found a, a Mexican place in London that's semi decent. Uh, if you ever ever go to London, let me know. I'll, I'll tell you where it is. Um, it's actually a chain, and it's it's really edible stuff. We're sitting in the basement of this place, and I'm sure that British intelligence is watching all of this. And we're because because we're talking about some pretty heavy stuff down there. I'm sort of wondering who's sitting around us, you know? Because mm. we're talking about jihad, and we're talking about all sorts of stuff like this. And when we walked out, I'm Scottish. I'm not a hugger. But, and this guy is six foot three. Ooh. But we hugged. 
in public, out there at Trafalgar Square. I could see Nelson's thing right over there. I hugged this guy, and he hugged me right back. Changes everything. Mm -hmm. Changes everything. Now, I can't always do that in every debate. Obviously, yeah. it's, it's just not a possibility. Yeah. But when a, when a relationship exists, and I'm talking here pretty much as a Christian debater now, uh, when a relationship exists, it can change everything. It really, it really can. Yeah, that's so good. Um, I have a feeling that that is connected to a question that is coming up on the uh, from some of the Patreon members there. So I'll, I'm going to save that because I, I think your point is well taken, that ultimately uh, there is a lot that can be traveled, a, a distance that can be traveled to change somebody's mind if they just recognize that first and foremost, we love them. Um, yeah. And this is Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, right? You can be the smartest debater on stage, but if you have not love, you're nothing. So um, right. Paul didn't actually say that. That's my paraphrase. But um, <laughs> let me let me, uh, let me me ask you this, because uh, it sounds like, you know, you're not, you're not averse to craziness on stage. <laughs> what is the craziest debate? I think I know what your answer is, but what is the craziest debate that you've ever participated in? Um... Yeah, the ventilation one is is right up there toward the top. Um, I, I had seen some debates he had done, so I, it wasn't like I was completely unprepared for the uh, three rows of tables with books on them with guys running around who are literally talking while I'm trying to speak. I don't know if you recall, I, I stopped once and actually asked them to be quiet. Um, <laughs> uh, it was just really annoying. Um, yeah. So I, I, it wasn't that I was completely blown away by that, but I had just never been in a context like that. And then, of course, his behavior was uh, just uh, amazing. Um, but aside from that, I have debated some people that probably in hindsight, sh we shouldn't have done it. it they, were, they were what was available. Uh, so there's this guy named uh, Nader Ahmed, in, uh, who's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I've I debated him one night, and the Muslims were yelling at him by the end of the debate. The, the Muslims were embarrassed by the end of the debate. And to be honest with you, no matter what the topic is, if it goes that poorly, um, to where the other side is walking out, or they're abusing their debater, or whatever else it might be, you sort of feel sorry for the guy, and you also sort of feel like, man, we didn't really show respect for this topic by handling mm. it the way that it ended up being handled tonight. Um, and so sometimes you walk away going, eh, well, um, Lord, use it for whatever you want to use it for. Um, uh, you know, I, I couldn't really necessarily foresee that it was going to go quite that way. Um, but, uh, you know, there's been some interesting audience participation a few times. Um, some well did you see the dan barker debate where he um uh the second debate we did where he objected to the moderator that i was quoting his books <laughs> no no i was no you know, that, you, know, you know who dan barker is the yes. head of uh yeah. freedom for religion foundation yeah uh he and i had gone back and forth in fact i debated him on the tom like show that's not one of them formal debate but I was on the Tom Lycus show with him when I was probably 23, maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. he was one of the first people. He's a brilliant guy, concert pianist, writes music. Um, very, very proud of his intellect, uh, but quote unquote, former Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a debate on the existence of Jesus. And so he makes his opening statement. And then I start making my opening statement and I'm quoting from books. He is selling in the foyer of the church. But he objects to my quoting those books because he didn't actually read them in his opening statement. Um, <laughs> and and the, poor mod, the poor moderator guy is just, he, all he wanted to do is keep time. He didn't want to be uh, dealing with something like this. Um, but yeah, I call it the don't quote me, bro. Uh, instead of don't tase me, bro. Yeah, don't tase me. Uh, it's the don't yeah. quote me, bro debate. Yeah, yeah, that, that was... Uh, that one was pretty uh, was pretty interesting too. Yeah, no. I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't mention um, the guy that wanted you to eat rat poison. Well, okay, um, it wasn't rat poison; it was antifreeze. 
Oh, antifreeze. Um, and so, so yes, that one definitely. That you, you need to understand something about that guy. That guy's brilliant. He designed the Luke hand. He has patents for what's called the Luke hand. It's a prosthetic hand yeah. uh, for you know soldiers coming home that can be controlled by your brain as to how hard you squeeze something, you can feel things. It's called the Luke hand from Star Wars. He designed mm. it. He's brilliant. And he hates God. Yeah. Massively so. And so I I've done two debates now with Jeff Durbin as my partner. We did that debate right before COVID. And then um, COVID shut everything down. And then uh, last April, finally, we got back to it. And we did a debate with two ethicists up there on whether mm -hmm. morality is possible without God. Yeah. And I've got to give, let, let me, let me say something about Jeff. Um, Eli, um, yourself, Jeff, you're the next generation. I'm, I'm getting old and um, I just hope that I have people around me uh, who will tell me that I need to step aside from doing some of the stuff that I do uh, when I need to do it. Mm -hmm. um i've seen people go too long and and it's and it's not good i want to finish well but i want to know when i'm finished you guys are the next generation and jeff i just love the guy um i never thought i'd be co-pastoring the same church with him that was not ever something that i thought was a possibility but the lord has ways of working things out you've got to understand something if you watch i'm not sure if you've seen the debate with the ethicists um not yet. but if you watch um, it keep something in mind Jeff had just been informed the day before that his mom's lung had collapsed from COVID. And he and his parents had been estranged. They just would not support his being involved in ministry at all. Mm. And so they had not seen each other in years and years. And so he, in that debate, has just made flight arrangements to try to get out before a blizzard came in. I got stuck in nine inches of snow up there in Salt Lake City because I drove up. Um, he did manage to get out. But he had so much, you know, on his mind that he could have mailed that in. Yeah. But you yeah. watch that debate and he is absolutely razor sharp. He is mm. sharp as attack. Um, I let him do most of the cross X for one, a very physical reason. He was seated to my right in both debates, actually. And the, the sound system in that room is getting worse and worse over the years. And I, I was struggling to hear the other side. He was physically able to hear them better mm. and hence be able to respond faster than, than I could. And he just killed it. I mean, he, 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 it, was, it was wonderful to, to listen to and to watch. Yeah. And then he flies home, and you know what the beautiful part is. He got to lead his mom to Christ before she died. Oh, so, wow. Um, yeah. It was it was it was incredible. So yeah, um, that's I am I. Boy. When, when I was younger, there was a guy named. Do you remember Bob Larson? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, back in the eighties, Bob Larson had a huge radio audience, mm -hmm. and he'd do cults and isms and stuff. So I was interested. He started getting weird eventually, but one of the things he would really do is he just super hard presser for raising money and stuff. And the whole idea was, if you don't support me, there's no one else to do this. Mm. And I, I very thankfully uh, decided right then and there, I'm never going to, I'm never going to take that, that track. I'm never going to believe that about myself. Um, that's not going to end well. And it hasn't ended well for him. And so mm. I know that the kingdoms, you know, if I get hit by a, Semi tractor trailer is not watching where it's going uh, as I'm driving home, and my ministry's over. Uh, the kingdom's not not done, and there are are people to pick up and to continue on. And I can only hope because I know I know Jeff listens to pretty much every dividing line, and um, there's one individual that I have sewn into that will be able to continue that work in the future and i know there's many many more like that that i've talked to over the years that's why you do what you do you don't do it for yourself you don't do it for, for your own name or something like that if you do that's all gonna it's all gonna pass away it's never gonna have any lasting value to it 
Um, yeah. And so I, yeah. I'm excited to see uh, these young guys like like Eli and Jeff and uh, just try to be encouragement to them and, and say, this is how you keep going after many, many years. Uh, mm-hmm. Because believe me, when we first started, <laughs> we had nothing. Uh, my wife and I had zip z- zero nada. And uh, you have to go through those times before you can get to the times where there's anybody who has any idea who in the world you are. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, and I, and I really appreciate your heart and because what you're talking about is discipleship, you know, um, taking the things that you've learned, the things that God has allowed you to experience and go through and then, uh, pour into somebody else and, uh, and watch them go a Timothy, um, in that spirit, I suppose, you know, what, what is your, I guess, advice for those, what I'm noticing from my vantage point, James is there seems to be a, a, I don't want to say a resurgence, but there seems to be a big interest right now in debate. And uh, maybe that's just anecdotal, um, you know, from my from my side of things. But uh, I, I'm seeing more and more people wanting to get into debate, which is not why I started doing what I was doing. <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a it's a interesting byproduct of it. And so, for those who are thinking about it, who wanted to get it to debate. Like, what is your advice for them? What should they do? You know, what should they not do? Well, I'm I'm normally rather pastoral at this point. And normally this question comes up. Um, unlike certain debaters who I will not name, <laughs> I spend hours after debates greeting people, talking to people, signing books, taking selfies, whatever, uh, hearing their stories about how the ministry has helped them over, well, our ministry is over 40 years old now. We started in in 83. And um, so when these young guys come up to me after a debate, um, that's the question that they'll ask. And what can I do? I wanna, and they've just seen something exciting. They didn't see the years and years and years that went into the preparation. And so I'll be perfectly honest with you. I normally look them in the eye And I say, if there's anything else you can do in obedience to God, do it. I throw water on them. I just simply throw water on them. Because look, if they're really called, my my throwing water on them isn't going to stop them. Mm -hmm. Because I want them to understand um, the feeling. I remember this one so clearly. We announced a seminar I was going to do on the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. And by the way, the New World Translation is a tough thing to deal with. That's, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a hard subject. Um, I had handouts ready, and we had this little conference room in the office complex that we sort of rented from. We could barely pay it. And it was going to be at 7 o'clock, and we had announced it and all this stuff. And I go down there, and I'm sitting there at 6.55 and 7 o'clock and 7.05. And by about 7.20, you pick up all the handouts. And you take them back to your office and you drive home and say goodnight to your wife and little kids. Um, and it's a, it's a horrible feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, no one showed up, you know. Um, does nobody care? Am I, am I not doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, the, the sacrifices that my wife made, that my kids made. Um, and then the, the study. That, that goes into it. When people ask me, what, what classes did you take that have been most helpful for you? I always say the same thing. Greek, church history. Two, two yeah. that, and I, don't, I do not understand this, but you can confirm this. Vast majority of apologists I know are not literate in the biblical languages. Mm. And I don't know why. I do not know why. But there are a bunch of people out there that are very well known they couldn't, they couldn't pick up a Greek New Testament and read if their life depended on it. And mm-hmm. it's been so helpful to me to know both biblical languages, but then also church history. I mean, good grief. If, if you want to pervert something, that's the, that's the, no one, most people don't know the difference between Ignatius Loyola and Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, and so you can get away with anything on, on those subjects. But people don't see the hours and hours and hours and hours of preparation that went into being able to have the background to have confidence. When I go into those cross-examinations, 
you know, when you've when you've done 182 debates, you've taught Greek, you've taught Hebrew, you've taught church history, apologetics, you've been on the Bible Answer Man and all sorts of other stuff, taking phone calls from all sorts of perspectives. That gives you a foundation to draw from, to be able to deal with, because because what's what scares most people? I'm going to hear an objection I've never heard before. Well, okay, yeah, yeah that can happen. Uh, no one can 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 uh, anticipate every objection that could be made. Um, but the broader and deeper your knowledge base is, the more confidence you're going to have in being able to answer in those types of situations. And that comes across. An audience an audience can tell when someone uh, really is giving an answer that's drawn from a wide field of knowledge rather than something from a you know a plastic covered sheet of a cheat sheet in front of them that they're just giving a you know a type of response from so yeah I, I i i try to let them know that uh it requires a lot of preparation a lot of study a lot of sacrifice uh and then i tell them what classes they need to be focusing upon and um go from there yeah yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, it's in in a in a way, it's sort of the the pastor answer as well. You know, and and uh, you're a pastor. I was a pastor for a number of years uh, before I started doing this, and so, you know, people would come up to us and say the same thing. Man, I want to be a pastor. I want to preach. I want to do that. And it's almost like, yeah, if you can do anything else, right? <laughs> Just go do that. Uh, I love yeah. that. That's, I, that's I a great answer. It's a fire in your bones. Don't don't even don't even try. It's got to be a fire in your bones. Well, thanks again, James, for sitting with me. It's just an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, It's been great. I've uh, uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. God bless. Yes, sir. Hey, friends, if you enjoyed this interview, then I encourage you to watch the full unedited version with over 30 minutes of Q&A with James White. Uh, this is over on our Patreon community. You can just click the link in the notes below. You can get access to that plus other exclusive member benefits. And I'll see you over on Patreon.